Uh, so this evening I'm, I'm going to give a few readings from the upcoming biography of Ajahn Chah and I've taken them from two, two chapters. Um, one chapter is, uh, at least in the original version, was called Karawasa Tam, Karawasa Tamma. And the other chapter, Samana Tamma. So there are some teachings uh, for lay people and some for monastics. And uh, the, first, the first passage um, I've chosen um, for a number of reasons. One, one is that it's, um, it's an account of a visit to pay respects to Ajahn Shah towards the end of his life where the, the rains retreat which he spent at uh, Tham Sangpet Monastery away from Wat Bapong, uh, one in which a number of the Western members of the Western Sangha were there with him. And um, it's the time when uh, Ajahn Pabakaro, who some of you may know, heard of, when Joseph Kappel uh, was his attendant. So he's referred to here, not by name, but um, it's just so you know, it, it's Joseph. And um, the another reason why I want to read this passage is that the, the account is given by um, somebody that some of you will know, and it's um, Yom Som Jai. Uh, Yom Som Jai is a lay nun at uh, Wat Bun Laam in Ubon these days, and um, a part, and she was the person who gave me the most help um, in the writing of the original Thai biography. So I owe her a great debt of gratitude, and so kind of appropriate to read something of hers to begin with. Every morning, Lung Po would walk very slowly on arms round across the rocky area between the sala and the kitchen. As soon as he appeared, a crowd converged on him to put food in his bowl. Those who hadn't brought any food with them or were too late to prepare it in time for arms round squatted on the ground, their hands in Anjali, all of them uh, expressing regret that they'd missed the opportunity to put food in his bowl. But it was all right, they would get their chance to offer their food in the sala at the mealtime. After the meal, everyone waited for Lumpur to come out and talk with the visitors. There was a huge number of people and a steady stream throughout the day. In the evening, it was a bit better. Most of the people who had come during the day had gone back. I listened to Lumpur give teachings from the early evening. He didn't sit on the Dhamma seat, but on his usual seat on the asana. He gave teachings in a relaxed, informal kind of way, interspersed with chat with various of his guests. I remember at one point in his talk, Lumpur was talking about making mindfulness continual, and to show us what he meant, he lifted his kettle and poured out the water, at first in drops and then in a steady stream. It was one of the similes that he was most fond of using in his talks. When it was time for him to, to rest, his attendant monk invited him to return to his kuti. We all just held our breath, afraid that he would leave us. It seemed like he'd only just started talking. Lumpur smiled at the monk, but didn't get up, and after a few minutes, the moments continued his talk for a while longer. The attendant monk repeated his request to Lumpur to rest, and we all groaned aloud. It was a plea and a protest. Lumpur smiled and turned to his attendant. I'll give them just a little bit more, he said, and continued talking until finally it must have really been time because when the monk invited him again in quite a firm voice, he picked up Lumpur's walking stick and stood there flashlight in hand to show that he was ready to take him back to his kuti. The attendant turned to all of us and said, it's already far past the time. Lumpur smiled at us once more in a consoling way, like a father. And then he said, they won't give me any more time. I suppose I'll have to go. It was as if everyone in the sala sighed with dismay. The time had flown by. It seemed that we'd only been listening for a few minutes. I'd heard a Dhamma talk from Lumpur's own mouth for the first time, and I was utterly satisfied. But I still wanted to hear some more. So... 
So the 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 chapter um, uh, called Karavasa Tamma has has many personal um, anecdotes and passages like this. But um, before I carry on at vain, just a couple of the the teachings that Lumpur was giving at this time. Um, in fact, I've included one that was. No, I'll put that one. Forget that. But this is just one. At the age of 50 or 60, your teeth start to come loose. Oh, you want to cry. You're eating and you feel like tears are going to fall. It's like you've been elbowed or kneed in the mouth. They ache so much. It's suffering, it's pain, it's torment. I've been through this myself. I had all my teeth pulled out. These in my mouth now, all false, every one of them. There were 16 left and I had them all pulled out at one go. I'd had enough of them. The dentist was scared to do it. I said, go ahead, I'll take the consequences. And so he did. Extracted all 16. About five of them were still firm, but I had them out anyway. It was tough. I couldn't eat for two or three days after. As a boy, while I was grazing the cows and water buffaloes, I'd even take ashes from the fire and polish my teeth to make them white. And when I got back home, I'd shoot myself a smile in the mirror just to see the whiteness. I was in love with my own bones, crazy. I loved my teeth so much, I thought they were good things, but in the end they had to go, and the pain almost killed me. My teeth had been aching for many months, many years. Sometimes my gums would swell up, upper and lower. It was terrible. So, if your teeth don't wobble yet, and you're brushing them so that they're clean and beautiful, be careful. Be careful they don't take it out on you in the end. We're like chickens, that's all. The chicken's born, has chicks, spends its day scratching around in the dirt, and then in the evening it goes to sleep. In the morning, jumps down to the ground and starts scratching around again. Cock, cock, cock. And then in the evening, it goes to sleep again. Is there any point to it? No. We're like chickens, like creatures with no wisdom. The owner comes every day with food, takes hold of the ch chicken, lifts it up in his arms to look at it. The chicken thinks the owner's being affectionate. As for the owner, he's thinking, hmm, it's getting heavy. How much does it weigh? The chicken doesn't know what's going on. The owner brings rice for it to eat. It's happy, thinks the owner loves it. Eats up all the rice, gets fat, thinks it's got its mate, thinks it's got it made. But as soon as the chicken weighs two or three kilos, that's it, it's off to the market. That's how most people lead their lives. They don't see the danger. They're deluded, just like the chicken. The owner takes the chicken off to the market. It's in the back of the truck, still clucking, oh, oh, having a great time. Then the car reaches the market, and the owner sells the chicken to a Chinese stall owner. The chicken still doesn't suspect anything. The Chinese guy tears the feathers off its neck, and the chicken thinks the guy's grooming it. The chicken's that stupid. It's only when the knife has cut its throat that the chicken realizes, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> we don't see our own life. We don't see how to remedy our defilements. What um. uh, Nana Chat um, began, um, as, as many of you will know, when the uh, a group of Western monks led by Ajahn Sumato um, at Wat Bapong were looking for a place to fire their bowls. In those days we had iron bowls which very easily got rusty and so one part of caring for your bowl was having to regularly fire it and to oxidize it. And there was a group of villagers that would go regularly for the lunar observance at uh, Wat Bapong from the village of Bungwai, and uh, the leaders of this group was a man called Po Am. And um, they, um, they suggested, I think, that the cremation forest outside their village would be, make a good place for the monks to fire their bowls and do a bit of a retreat. And so the monks went there, and one thing led to another, and they invited them to 
spend the rains retreat, that the lay people would uh, build kutis for them, and so what Bananacha began. So one of the, the key figures and the, the leading layman, the layman who would um, lead the request for precepts and so on on the Lunar Observance Day was Po'am, who was a herbal doctor. So this next passage um, is from Po'am. Some people were impressed by Ajahn's te- Ajahn Chah's teachings but were too proud and stubborn to accept them without a fight. One such man was the herbalist Po Am, who argued with Ajahn Chah until he fainted. <laughs> Before I came to revere Lumpur, I argued with him for four days and four nights. During the days, I helped him plant a row of bamboos around the circumference of the monastery. At night times, I dispute with him right through to dawn. I say something like, if the rice is my rice and the flour is my flour, how can it be bad kama to make it into booze? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and he replied, you've got a knife, you can use the sharp side to kill and destroy, or you can use it to prepare food. So we argued for four days and nights. On the fourth day, at noon, I felt dizzy and I fainted. <laughs> Lumpur came to see what was wrong. I said, I don't know, everything's gone dark, I can't see anything. Lumpur took me by the hand and led me to the mango grove. Then he rang the bell. There were about six monks there at that time. He told them to bring a mat and pillow for me to lie on. Then he told them to put four water jars to the north of me and two to the south and fill them up to the brim. I don't know how long I lay there before I regained consciousness I tried to retrace my movements. The last thing I remembered that I was, at, was that I was at the hall. What was I doing in the mango grove? I turned to the west and I was confused, looked about me. Then I heard Lumpur's voice speaking to me from behind my head. Poor Am, poor Am. I lifted up my head and twisting it round, saw Lumpur behind me. He was sitting cross-legged on a bamboo platform watching over me. He said, That's what happens when you take on a monk. You argued all night, you argued all day, four days and four four nights. You can't defeat a monk, you know, and that's why you fell unconscious. Hmm. The vapor from the jars of water was really cool. It's medicinal for people who have fainted. It's cool, comfortable and refreshing. So now when I look back on it, I, I see that I had it all wrong. Ajahn Chah said that someone who lives in a high place is capable of seeing someone who is below him, but someone who lives in a low place can't see someone who is higher. I reflected on that. He was right. Another um, colourful figure um, in the history of Wapapong was uh, a layman called... uh, well, we came, I knew him as Lung Da Se. Um, he became a monk um, in his later life, but uh, had a very checkered career. He was um, a bit of a shady character in some, some versions, a bit of a gangster. Um, but Ajahn Chah took, took him on and uh, tried to train him. I did train him. During the, during the 1960s, Ajahn Chah's health was still robust, and every now and again he would leave Wat Bapong and take to the road for a short spell of Tudong, um, that's like wandering around in the countryside, sometimes accompanied by monks, sometimes by lay people. One of his most frequent lay companions was a man called Sui. Sui was a lay supporter with a notorious reputation for criminal, criminal activities, greed, and sensual indulgence. On Tudong, Ajahn Chah could find skillful means to teach him the error of his ways. So he suffered a lot on these trips, and yet he treasured the memory of them to the end of his life, which he reached as a monk at Wapapong. He took a group of us on Tudong out to Buntarik. There were half a dozen of us to start with, but two ran away on the first night. On the following nights, more and more ran away until in the end I was the only one left. I said I felt homesick, and so he replied that the trip might last a year. 
<laughs> the more I wanted to go back, the further he said he'd take me. I just gave in and took what came. One night he made me sleep by a bamboo clump, even though it really stunk of excrement. As the dew fell, the smell got even worse. When, he complained, when I complained, he scolded me. Don't make such a fuss. There's more crap in your intestines than there is out there. <laughs> Wherever we went, I'd always have my eyes out for edible fruits. We reached Kumuang and I came across a beautiful s'more tree. And s'more is this, this little um, bitter... Um, what do you call them? Like crab apple kind of thing, aren't they? Yes. More like an olive, and and they're allowed. Uh, monks can eat them in the afternoon, and they're uh, um, what what do you call it? Um, medicinal. Medicinal. Laxative. laxative. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's start again. Um, we reached Kumuang, and I came across a beautiful samor tree. Lumpur told me to climb up and shake the branches. The s'mores cascaded down and made a bundle of them in my pakoma cloth, uh, the cloth that Thai men wear around their waist and is used for various things. So now I had to carry Lumpur's bowl and his yam, his bag, which was heavy by itself, and the s'mores. Lumpur didn't carry anything at all. <laughs> As we walked along, I wanted to throw some of the s'mores away. But then we came to another tree, even more bountiful than the last one, <laughs> and Lumpur had me collect another great pile of s'mores. I thought he would help me to carry something, but he wouldn't. Anyway, I tasted a few of the s'mores from the first tree, a few from the second tree, and before long, diarrhea came on in a big way. <laughs> I was carrying so much stuff, I couldn't put it all down in time. Lumpur had to teach me the field method of excretion. There's no need to squat down, he said. Stand and grasp hold of a tree. Crap like a water buffalo. <laughs> Uh, you, can, you can do that, can't you? So I stood and excreted until my bowels were empty. Ten o'clock at night and we were still walking. He wouldn't rest. We reached the stream which he crossed on a dead tree. I couldn't do that and waded through. The water was deep and my baggage was heavy and I couldn't get up the other bank. Lumpur had to go down and drag me up. I was soaked through. It was midnight before he would stop walking. This is so much suffering, I groaned. Lumpur comforted me. It's through seeing suffering that you become wise, he said. I was exhausted. As he spoke, I started to drift off into sleep, and so he scolded me again. I'll give you a teaching and you fall asleep. <laughs> but as I lay there, I noticed he was using my cloth to drive the mosquitoes away from me. I slept for a long time. Whenever I opened my, ma my eyes, he was still sitting there cross-legged. Lumpur, aren't you tired? You haven't laid down at all, I couldn't help asking. The more tired I am, the better the meditation, he replied, and then told me off again. Someone who thinks of nothing except sleeping sees someone setting an example that doesn't take it. But I can't keep awake, I had to argue with him. In the end, I persuaded him to return. All right, if you want to go back, we'll go back, he said. He must have seen that I was at the end of my tether. A car passed. This is the next day. A car passed. In those days, there weren't any proper roads. Cars had to go along the buffalo tracks. When he saw us, the driver stopped and ran over to invite us to go with him. Lumpur said, Oh, which I thought meant yes. <laughs> <laughs> I prepared to get into the car, but no. The driver came over to repeat his invitation. Lumpur said, uh, again, but he didn't get into the car, and the car went without us. When I complained, Lumpur said, have you come to ride in cars or to walk on Tudong? Well, couldn't we have given him the bag of s'mores? And how do we know where he's going, Lumpur snapped. By now I was getting angry. The car was moving farther and farther away. Lumpur, are you trying to kill me or what? Of course, he replied immediately. <laughs> I brought you along to kill your defilements. Everything, everything you say is defilement. If you don't come on a journey like this, how will you be free from defilements? Try lying around doing nothing and see if you get liberated. All that will happen is that your suffering will multiply. You have to be acquainted with suffering before you can go beyond it and realize happiness. The reason I've brought you along is to make merit, to search for merit. Can you see that? Merit and defilement both lie within us. Your cravings never come to an end. You make ten baht and you want a hundred. You get a hundred, you want a thousand. 
But on this trip, your cravings aren't arising because you're too tired. You don't want anything at all. If you do get anything, what would you do with it? Don't you realize that you're going to die? Each day, try and think of death. You're going to die, you know. Lumpur went on like this at great, at great length before turning around and asking me, do rich people die? Do poor people die? Yes, they all die, I answered, really irritated by now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And don't you think you're going to die as well? You've been trying to get rid of your suffering by chasing after more suffering. Do you think that will save you from death? The poor die and so do the rich. You have to be liberated before you can be happy. In the end, he asked me another question. So what do you think the answer is? Become a monk, I said, thinking I'd made a pretty intelligent answer. And if you don't practice, will becoming a monk free you of suffering? It's kamma. We do good and we do evil. If you do good, you get good results. If you do evil, you get evil results. So what to do except do good? And that's what you're doing. I brought you here to do good. Passing through trials and tribulations will lead you beyond suffering. Two days later, when he saw a certain yang tree, he said, there's the monastery, we're almost there. I said, I'll leave the stuff here and come back to pick it up tomorrow. I was bargaining again, and as usual, he wouldn't have any of it. I had to take everything along. Every time I tried to get up, he'd have to pull me up by my arm with one hand and push me up on my bottom with the other because I really couldn't get up at all. My load was so heavy. I was carrying things over both shoulders with his yarn hanging from my neck, water kettles in my hand. Lumpur carried nothing except his walking stick. He walked on slowly teaching me as we went about what I've no idea at all. <laughs> shall, shall we spend the night here and go on in the morning? I tried again. <laughs> How can we stop now? We're almost there, he said in his usual way. So I dragged myself to the monastery while he walked on ahead and rang the monastery bell. The monks and novices came rushing out. There were three, uh, there were three of them. He greeted them in a gruff voice. Don't just laze around like that. Go and help Sir. quickly. He's almost dead. <laughs> <laughs> when I arrived, Lumpur put on a concerned voice. Oh, how did you carry so much stuff? You poor fellow. And nobody went out to help you at all. Then he told me to start pickling the s'mores. <laughs> we filled two big earthenware jars and they lasted the sangha for two years. <laughs> Not a single one was spoiled. There was another time we reached a sawmill and went in to take shelter for the night at the woodpile. The owner invited us to go into the house for a bath and to sleep there. I was getting the stuff ready to follow him into the house when Lumpur told me off. What are you, some kind of dog? Somebody calls you and you trot along behind them? The owner came and offered some soft drinks. He repeated his invitation for us to go over to the house. Lumpur just made that non-committal uh, uh sound again. Uh, the owner went off to prepare rooms for us. I asked Lumpur, we're going, are we? And he scolded me again. They put down a single lump of rice as a bait and you're ready to go, are you? I tried a new approach. It's not convenient to sleep here. How can you sit and lie down properly on a wood pile? Lumpur ended the debate. We're staying here. The next morning, the house owner asked us in which direction we were heading. Lumpur told him that we were going to Korat. That's two days' walk from here. No tigers in the forest, sir, he said, asking if he could send us there in his car. Sir, do you want to go in the car? Lumpur asked me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I replied quickly. <laughs> then we were invited up to the third floor of the house where we had a shower and they offered the daily meal. The owners were sawmill millionaires and there were a great number of dishes. Lumpur teased me. Now you're happy, aren't you? I was starving, hungry. But just as I was about to tuck in, Lumpur said something that spoilt my appetite. Don't try getting anything out of your association with monks, so it's bad karma. After the meal, the lay people offered detergent, toothpaste, matches, bathing cloth, and a sum of money. Lumpur said, are you going to take their things? Yes. Why not? They offered them freely. We didn't steal them. Wherever this fellow goes, he makes money, Lumpur grumbled. It, it was eight o'clock that night before the owners of the house came up to the room the lady of the house invited us to have another shower before setting off and she offered new bathing cloths she even put a bowl there to receive the water from Lumpur's bath which she, she was going to bathe in as lustral water 
Lumpur said he had no spells to bless the water and told that if she wanted to be happy and well, then she'd have to create the causes. Making wishes wasn't enough. She gave the chauffeur some more money to buy anything we might need on the way. We stopped at one place where they were grilling corn cobs. The driver bought a huge bag full, but I didn't dare take any. I was afraid Lumpur said I was out to make a profit, and so I just drank water. We reached Korat at five in the morning, and the driver gave me the money that was left over. That afternoon we came to a village and stopped for a rest in one of the surrounding fields. There were people around grazing their cattle, and they came over to pay their respects. Lumpur said to me, Take that money and buy soft drinks. Bring over three or four crates. I got angry. I wanted to keep the money, and he was having me buy drinks for buffalo herders. There was so much they couldn't finish it all, and he told them to take the remainder home with them. When we eventually got back to the what, he asked me, How much money is left? We need bricks and cement at the monastery. <laughs> I said it would have been a better idea to keep the whole lot for bricks and cement instead of spending it on soft drinks. No, that would have been a bad idea because we wouldn't have offered dana and the buffalo graders, grazers wouldn't have had any soft drinks. They were tired. And they must have been thirsty. When you drank some, you were refreshed, weren't you? Yes, I replied sheepishly. Well then, he said, and gave me another long sermon. The happiness that we give others makes us happy. Where else are you going to look for happiness? You have to raise your mind up high. Then when the floods come, it stays dry. If you indulge in low things, then your mind becomes baser. Whatever you do, you don't see Dhamma. The teachings of the Buddha are ancient, it's true, but they're always worth listening to. But old things that are low and base, they sully your mind wherever you, whenever you speak of them. You should only speak of things that brighten the mind. There was one time when Lumpur's eyes became very painful. I couldn't bear it. I tried to find some medicine for him, but he wouldn't use it. I didn't know what else to do, and I started to cry. An old man almost on your deathbed, and you're still crying. Laugh. It's only my eyes that hurt. You have to laugh as if it didn't hurt. You have to fight with death until you go beyond it. Two days later, he must have remembered a remedy. He told me to find some goisa leaves. Uh, leaves, and make a poultice to apply to his eyes. This is kamma, he said. It's the result of kamma I made as a boy. When I, was a, when I was a kid, if I saw a gecko, I couldn't leave it alone. I'd stab it through one of its big bulgy eyes, chop it up with onions, and then grill it on the fire. It was really delicious. Now that's all caught up with me. Whoever creates good kamma gets good results. Whoever creates bad kamma gets bad results. That's how it is. People's actions always catch up with them. Don't think that once you've done something, that's the end of it. Whoever cheats somebody will end up being required to give back what they've given. They've taken. Have you, take, have you given up all those things you used to do when you were a gangster? If I'm staying with you, I can, I replied. But, <laughs> but if I'm around my old circle of friends and see them drinking alcohol and I hear the sound of bamboo flutes and drums, my mind runs wild and I can't stop. But later on, I did abandon all my old ways, and then I felt repelled by what I used to do, and I told Lumpur. He said, that's what happens. You've crossed over the small streams. That's what liberation means. That's how it takes place. You've been able to give up drinking, give up smoking, various worldly pleasures, give up being a tough guy. It means you've attained something. If you want to attain anything more than that, then you should shave your head and become a monk. But if you're really going to attain, you have to see the Dhamma. What is the Dhamma? Dhamma is the Buddha. You see the Buddha, you see the Dhamma. Things become brighter and brighter. It's not that you always have to live in the dark. If you come out into a bright place, it's bright. Poor Sir took Ajahn Chah's advice and lived as a monk at Wapapong <coughs> till his death. So that's the end of the section of Lumpur and lay people. Next uh, is the, some teachings for monks. Um, <clears throat> by the mid-1950s, most of the large wild animals indigenous to northeast Thailand, tigers, wild boar, elephants, had disappeared from the rural areas of Ubon, remaining only in the more remote mountainous areas on the Lao and Cambodian borders. 
in Bapong, situated relatively close to a number of long-established villages, only smaller creatures survived. Wild chickens, squirrels, chipmunks, flying foxes, flying lemurs, tortoises, snakes, civet cats, mouse deer, various kinds of birds. Almost all of these were hunted by the villagers. Over the years, Ajahn Chah did everything he could to encourage local people to give up hunting. If, however, hunting did gradually decline, it was probably as much through the decimation of the hunted as any increased restraint by the hunters. At least Ajahn Chah was able to maintain the monastery as a refuge for creatures. On the large sign at the monastery gate, uh, it was prominently declared that the monastery was a sanctuary, a ket apayatan, literally an area in which the gift of freedom from fear is extended to all beings. There were many creatures in the... F uh, uh, sorry. So... Uh, Often, the forest creatures would form the subjects of homilies delivered to the Sangha. So here's uh, Lumpur teaching the monks. Look at how spry the forest chickens are, how wary of danger. And they're no gluttons. The moment they become conscious of a threat, even while they're eating, they're away. These forest chickens are vigilant. They protect themselves, and they can fly high. When they sleep, they rest on tree branches and treetops, each one to himself. Not like domestic chickens. They eat a lot. They're heavy. They're ponderous. They can't fly high. They don't have their wits about them. Even if one manages to run off, it soon gets mauled by dogs. Domestic chickens receive attention from human beings. They're looked after, and it makes them heedless. The forest chickens are different. They're alert and self-reliant. They go about their business without any fuss. They're punctual. Come rain or shine, even if it's bitterly cold, when it's time to crow, they crow. In fact, they're so reliable, we use them as an alarm clock. They're consistent about their work, and they never demand any reward from anyone for doing it. They live at ease in nature. They don't seem to get attached to anything. It's almost as if they have their own kind of dhamma practice. They don't think a lot. They're not inquisitive or doubtful. They don't look for things to stir up their minds. Look at the forest chickens. Take them as your teachers. Uh, the other night um, I read one or two passages um, concerning ordination. And uh, tonight I'm going to uh, read a passage um, in which Ajahn Chah teaks, uh, talks to a monk who's considering disrobing. In a memoir of his training at Wabapong, a monk um, writing under the pseudonym of Lung Da remembers an occasion when a senior monk, the abbot of a branch monastery, arrived with the news that he'd fallen in love and wanted to disrobe and get married. Lung Po said, flip this love of yours over into a universal love, a love for all sentient beings, like the love of a mother or father for their child. It's the way that I look on everyone here as my children or grandchildren. Wash the sensuality out of your love, just like people soak the head of a wild yam to let the poison out before they eat it. Love is the same. You have to reflect on it, look at it until you see the suffering that's involved, and then gradually remove the germ of intoxication from it so that you're left with a pure love, like that of a teacher for his disciples. If you can't wash the sensuality out of love, then it will still be there exerting its power over you when you're an old man. Reflect on the suffering of sexual desire until you can let it go. If you can't solve the problem with wisdom, or at least reduce its strength, then leave your monastery for the time being. When you've re-established your practice, then go back again. When you fall down, you have to know how to pick yourself up again. You have to know how to struggle and crawl. When you've been knocked over, don't just lay there helplessly and give in. Having a family would imprison you. Um, when you're married, you can't go anywhere. You can't go on Tudong. You can't follow the Ajahn around. The baby cries, your wife grumbles, your father-in-law scolds you, your mother-in-law hates you, the pots and pans completely box you in. Think about it. There's an old saying about the five unstoppable things. Rain about to fall, excrement about to leave the body, 
a person about to die, a child about to be born, and a monk about to disrobe. The first, <laughs> the first four are unstoppable, it's true, I believe, but not the last one. I'm confident that you can prevent a monk disrobing. I, my, I myself once thought of disrobing and I changed my mind. If you disrobe, you'll have to take on burdens, establish yourself in the world. It's not as free and congenial as being a monk. There's a saying, living a solitary life is really comfortable, but there's no fun to it. Living with another is really fun, but there's discomfort and suffering in it. I would say that there's only very little fun to it. It's like the taste of food. The taste is all on the surface of your tongue. As soon as you swallow, it's gone. But if you keep meditating until your mind becomes calm and lucid and you see the Dhamma, then you will truly be at ease. Sometimes you can be so full of bliss that you don't need to eat at all. And it's a profound ease, not just a pleasant sensation on the surface of your tongue. There's a story about a monk who disrobed and very shortly afterwards got married. On his wedding night, he started to cry. His wife ah, said to him, What's the matter, dear? Have I done something wrong? No, he said, I'm crying from regret. If I'd known married life was like this, I would have disrobed years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but... Time went on, <laughs> and then there were children to raise, and he found he couldn't compete so well in the world. He'd been a monk. He couldn't be as deceitful as other people. It was more difficult for him to do immoral things. Now all he could see was the suffering of lay life, and before long he was crying out to reordain. You've been a monk for many years. Do more meditation. Look inwards at your heart. Why do you have to disrobe? And what about all your lay supporters that used to come and pay respects to you? How will you be able to look them in the face? And what do you think you'll do once you're disrobed? Whatever kind of suffering arises, then contemplate it. Look at it until it's clear. Sometimes when it's not clear, then you have to fast and go without sleep and fight with it. Be willing to die. Tanajan Tongrat once considered disrobing. He wouldn't listen to anybody who tried to dissuade him. His mind was made up. But then he asked for an axe from the villagers and started chopping logs. He chopped for three days and three nights until he was exhausted and his hands were covered in blisters. Then he, then he shouted out loud, Now do you know who the master is? He was talking to his defilements. Great masters have been through this. Uh, like Ajahn... Uh, X. He fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> no, they really want to know. <laughs> no, I don't know who it was. Um, he fell in love with a woman who put food in his bowl and arms around. His friends took him off to meditate and shut him up in the boat. He fasted for five or six days, and then his mind flipped over. He saw the unattractiveness of the body. His mind became calm and lucid. He saw the Dhamma, and so he survived. Sexual desire is your weak point and you have to remedy it with meditation on the unattractive parts of the body. Keep testing your strength until you know how much you can take. Don't let the defilements keep punching you on your weak spot till they knock you out. Develop more skill in meditation. If the defilements come high, then duck underneath them. If you're not strong enough to take them on, then when they come at you low, jump over them and run away for the time being. Next passage is about working. Apart from the daily chores, um, outside of the range retreat, there would also be regular work projects, mostly involving building or repair of Sangha dwellings. The first and most basic reason that the majority of the work was done by the monastic community itself was a lack of funds. Even if Ajahn Chah wanted to employ local people, he could not have done so, but he did not want to. Working as a group was a good opportunity for the monks to develop those qualities of constant effort and patient endurance that he felt were vital to progress in meditation. Manual labor for many hours a day in the hot sun, sustained by one simple meal a day, was not easy. Work projects also gave monks the opportunity to practice mindfulness in a less controlled situation and thus afforded Ajahn Chah the opportunity 
to check out how well the monks could maintain their mindfulness in such a setting. Working together was a good way of creating and enhancing the harmony of the Sangha. Also in later years, when the community had grown much larger, there were always young monks and novices with a lot of surplus outgoing energy. They were too restless to be left to meditate alone very much, and work projects were a good way of instilling some basic mindfulness training. Or at least that was the theory. Sometimes Lung Po Ajahn Chah would lead the monks in work until late at night, for instance, on the year when they built the boat. The monks would light hurricane lamps and keep going until 11 or 12 at night, almost every day. Some monks complained that their meditation practice was suffering. Uh, Ajahn Chah replied, this is practice. As you work, look at your mind. How does it feel when I get you to do this kind of thing? Practice doesn't mean evading things all the time. You have to come out and face up to the defilement so that, so that you know what they're like. After you train, then you have to climb up into the ring. In the future, you will see the fruits. But for now, don't, play, don't blame or praise, just do the work. That is how he would caution the monks. Most were satisfied. A few disgruntled left. Lumpo Liam, Ajahn Liam said, in work projects, Lumpur emphasized giving up our own comfort and desires for the benefit of others. This kind of sacrifice is the dana, the giving of monks. It arises in a generous heart that considers the benefit of the group. Lumpur often replied to lay people who said that they didn't have enough time to practice by asking them, aren't you hurrying too much? In fact, there's plenty of time, but when we hurry, our craving makes us feel that we're short of time. When we want to do something, on the other hand, then we don't want to stop. But at Wapapong, we weren't working from desire. We were doing it in the spirit of self-sacrifice. We showed how making sacrifices for the group was a beneficial Dhamma practice. Work projects at Wapapong could be demanding, to say the least. Often the monks would be involved in hard physical labor for many hours a day. But the most legendary of work projects was the four-month-long construction of a road up the hill to Wat Tamsangpet, a branch monastery some 50 miles to the north of Wat Bapong. Ajahn Anek was one participant. The head of the highways department said to Lumpur that he, if he really decided to go ahead with the project, he would send people to help. But after two or three days, the men from the highway departments had had enough. They couldn't endure the, the mamui. It's a um, bit like poison oak. They said, this level of work needs a proper budget. You need explosives, tractors. With this number of people, it's impossible. Lumpur sat there and said nothing. The day after the highways people left, we made our own survey. Once we decided on where the road should go, we got down to work. There was hardly any time for rest. We would start work at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and finish at 3 in the morning. We got through one pair of flip-flops after another. The work consisted mainly of breaking up rocks and carrying them to where they were to be laid. After a time, the highways department saw we weren't going to give up, and every now and again they would bring some explosives up for us, and the villagers helped with that. Lumpur would start teaching lay people after the meal and would sit there right through until the afternoon without a break. We'd have a rest during the middle of the day. When we came out, he'd still be sitting there talking with the lay people. At three, he would start work and do the whole shift until three the next morning. Nobody could keep up with him. When he wasn't supervising, he was raking. It was strange. We were all younger than Lumpur, but we had to admit that we couldn't keep up with him. He would never be the one who suggested taking a break. At three in the morning, We'd rest for a short time, and then at dawn we'd have to leave on arms round. Everyone was exhausted, but he kept us going until the job was finished. It was really tough. We put our lives on the line. At one point I sustained a hemorrhage, an internal bruising. I felt a tightness in my chest. I couldn't breathe properly, and I think that was probably the start of my heart complaint. Everything had to be done well, well and quickly. If anyone started to make jokes or to act playfully, Lumpur wouldn't say anything, but he'd immediately walk away. The next day there would be a Dhamma talk. He'd say, act like a monk, act like a Dhamma practitioner. Whatever he did, he did with total sincerity. And however tired or weary he felt, I never once heard him complain. 
Um, it is normal and not a bad thing in itself that monks putting forth effort to overcome defilements become tense at times or feel frustrated. Ajahn Chah would say that if monks felt no resistance to their practice, then they probably weren't doing enough to cut through old habits. He would nonetheless keep his finger on the pulse of the community and and a clear eye out for signs of monks becoming obsessive or depressed. If he felt the atmosphere was getting overwrought, informal sessions under his kuti, with him telling stories and anecdotes from the past in the earthy Lao dialect, would uplift the monks and sometimes make them laugh their uptightness away. Ajahn Chah was a born raconteur and he knew how to create create an atmosphere that was warm, intimate, relaxed, but still focused, albeit in a more informal way, on Dhamma practice. However late these sessions lasted, almost nobody would want to leave. One monk remembers walking away from Ajahn Chah's kuti after one such session thinking, these nights I will remember when I'm an old man. So a um, number of these stories don't always work so well in translation, but um, this following story is an example uh, of a... Re- sorry, this is a pa- I'm just uh, paraphrasing here. Um, the, a lot of the humorous stories are based on um, knowledge and familiarity with local customs and, and values um, and so on. But anyway, this story is about a fishing family. The Isan villagers eat a lot of fish which they catch in the local rivers, streams and ponds. One of the most common fish is called the chon or serpent-headed fish, considered to resemble the human penis. Ajahn Chongjan relates that Ajahn Chah told the chon fish story at the time when a number of younger monks had caught the teaching bug. It was a common phenomenon amongst monks whose meditation practice was starting to develop. Armed with a vocabulary gleaned from Ajahn Chah's Dhamma talks, they would have to share their insights at great length with whoever they could trap (laughs) to listen. So he would tell this story. After getting married, a young couple moved in with the wife's family. The husband was constantly trying to show off his abilities to impress his mother and father-in-law. He wanted them to see what a capable son-in-law they had acquired, how hard-working he was, how good at making a living. The house was near a stream, and in the evening, the young man would go with his father-in-law to set a catfish trap, which consisted of a bamboo basket containing part of a termite mound full of termites as bait, weighed down with rocks. Early in the morning the young man would check on the trap. In those days, people were very poor. Cloth was hard to come by, and the young man had no underpants. After he took off his trousers on the bank, he would go down into the water naked. On one particular day, the trap was crammed full of the lucrative catfish, threshing around wildly, unmixed with the doctor fish or the blachon that would earn a lower price. It was a very good catch. He carried the trap full of fish back to the house, so overjoyed at his success that he forgot to put his trousers on. He climbed up the stair to the house, still marvelling to himself, nothing but catfish, and went to find his wife who was rinsing the sticky rice grains. Hearing his voice, she looked up, only to see him standing there naked, saying, nothing but catfish. She pointed to his groin and said, then where did you get the blood chorn? Where did, where did you get the chorn fish? Her words broke the spell, and the young man, looking down at his nakedness, went bright red and sprinted back to the stream for his trousers. Lumpur told the younger monks that wanting to show off about their practice, oblivious of their embarrassing faults visible to everyone except themselves, made them just like the young man, who was so keen to impress his family that he didn't realize that he was exposing his chornfish. <laughs> Um, so the last section is on uh, Tudong and uh, one of Ajahn Chah's senior disciples uh, Lumpur Jan told uh, uh, related the detailed advice that 
uh, Ajahn Chah gave him before he set off walking uh, on on Tudong, and that's walking alone um, in the jungle in the forest, looking for quiet places to meditate, visiting teachers. Lumpur said that if you're going to stay in a cave, then you should make inquiries with the local lay people first, because there are some caves where monks have committed serious offences against the vinya. Um, these are called disaster caves. You shouldn't go and stay in such caves. Or if in that area there are fierce animals or local spirits or guardian deities, when you arrive you should stop, stand and make a resolution. I'm going to enter this cave. I come as a friend in order to help you be free of suffering, not as an enemy to do you harm. Establish your attention in that way. If there are animals or anything else living there, then just invite them to be at their ease. There's no need to doubt or to be suspicious. I've come here to put forth effort in my meditation to do good. If you wish to carry on and stay together with me, then do as you wish. Having first made that determination, then enter the cave purposefully and with mindfulness. He said that if you go and stay anywhere where there are wild animals like tigers or elephants, then to abstain from eating meat, because when you eat meat you give off an odor and it may lead animals to harm you. Not eating meat is a protection. Going on Tudong is like entering a battlefield. Morality is very important, and you must try to look after it with every breath, every step of the way. If you break your precepts, all kinds of unpleasant things can happen to you. Sometimes it might be stomach aches. Sometimes you might rave delir deliriously in your sleep, have nightmares. Sometimes it may be animals or spirits coming to harm you. So keep reflecting on your morality. If an animal, say a buffalo, means to harm you, then usually it will lower its head, but it can't get very low. So if you can't get away, then duck down below its horns and away to one side, or try opening your glot. If it's startled, it will run away. If there's a ditch around, then go down into it. It will be unable to gore you properly. When bulls are about to butt, they shut their eyes. If your mind is really firm, then stand your ground, and as it runs in, then at the last moment, move away at a slight angle. But you might not be quick enough. It, it depends on your strength of mind and agility. When you use a torch, i.e. flashlight, <laughs> <laughs> he spoke e English, English, um, then, uh, then don't shine it straight in front of you. Hold it out to one side. So if a desperado takes a shot at you, he'll shoot at the flashlight and miss. <laughs> Lung Por advised us on everything. If more than one monk goes to stay in a cremation forest, then he said you should stay well apart. Mind you, if Lung Por himself was one of the group, then he would cough every now and again just to encourage you. He always stressed that we shouldn't be hesitant about the practice. It was correct, it was right. If it wasn't, the Buddha wouldn't have abandoned his wife and child. So there's no need to fear death, no need to fear breaking a leg or crippling oneself. He told me to be wary, not to get attached to anybody, and most importantly, not to break my precepts, because then something untoward would happen. He said not to stay in forbidden areas. Observe the shade. Check out above to see if there are any dead branches that might fall down. While you're walking, keep an eye out for tree stumps. If you speak to lay people, consider their level of understanding. Don't be contentious or aggressive. Whenever you're about to enter a forest, stop at the edge and spread loving kindness. There's no need to go sightseeing. Look at the inner sights. You don't need to go and visit a lot of teachers. Go and stay in cremation forests. Maintain your practice of chanting and bowing in such places. Be restrained and don't stay anywhere for long or you will form attachments to the lay people. Another thing he warned about was people coming to ask for lottery numbers. He said, tell them you don't know and that you'll give them something better, the principles of practice. If they pester you and you can't get away from them, then teach about practice the five, eight precepts and let them come up with the numbers themselves. <laughs> Examine people's characters. They may be dangerous to you. But on the other hand, they may be clever through having previously looked after monks. Then they will come and attend to you. At night times, they will bring their families to take the precepts. And on the lunar observance day, they will come to take eight precepts. He also cautioned me about and advised me to be patient with conflicts with fellow monks. If you go for more than a month or two with a group of five monks, there's usually only one or two left by the end. The combination of tiredness and harsh surroundings gives rise to arguments. 
sometimes about things like the route or the place to rest. Some monks can be forgetful. They leave things behind and have to go back for them, which annoys their friends. There are many problems, particularly with shortage of requisites. To go on Tudong, you need a great deal of patience and endurance. He said, if people come and ask you about levels of, of absorption and enlightenment, then tell them you're not interested in that way of talking. He said, our way of practice came down to whether you can abandon greed, hatred and delusion. Are you grasping at material things? If someone abuses you, do you get angry? As for different absorptions, the teachers don't teach about those things. They teach to watch your mind and in that way to be free from Mara's snare. And just one last passage, sort of an appendix really. Um, <clears throat> Tudong monks like to seek out secluded places to practice, but places that are far from the hustle and bustle of the world are also far from modern conveniences, and most crucially, they may be hours from the nearest hospital. It is thus important for Tudong monks to have a knowledge of herbal medicines so as to be able to make use of the things nat nature gives freely to treat their illnesses, Ajahn Deluxe's. The most popular medicine amongst Tudong monks is pickled urine, it is buried in earthenware jars, sometimes for years, and then filtered and boiled up with fresh ginger and salt. When you're used to it, you can use it as an emetic. Pure urine takes about seven or eight months to mature. If you put ginger, lemongrass, galangal, kaffir, lime peel in with it, three months is enough. As for the constituents, it depends on you. Some monks use two parts of urine to one of fresh water, and some vice versa. My own experience is that if you drink pickled urine once a week, it's good for digestion. But it's not good to drink it every day, because your body becomes dependent on it. And if you stop, you get constipated. Sometimes the roots uh, that are used in the pickling are kept for three months and then dried and pounded. Monks take them with them on their journeys and boil them in water to make a drink. Lumpur once told the Sangha that before going on Tudong, he would finally pound... Uh, somlom leaves together with salt and then pack the mixture tightly into a length of bamboo and roast it which would leave a dried stick within the bamboo. When he wanted to eat some he'd dig it out of the tube with a knife. He said that if you have no tonic to drink in the afternoon then you can eat a little of this instead. For malaria he re re recommended eating sadao leaves and about six inches of boropet vine a day as a prophylactic. If you have malaria badly then you should pound the boropet, extract the sap and drink it. Some people like to cut boropet into little rings and lightly roast them with salt. Its aroma is as good as coffee. Lumbo said he got a lot of his remedies, especially those for snake bite, from his elder brother, Po Yela. Another medicine that Tudong monks have used successfully to cure snake bite is the one allowed by the Buddha in the Vinaya. In the event of snake bite, you're allowed to cut living wood and then burn the wood and mix the wood ash with urine and excrement, and having strained it, give it to the bitten person. It causes violent vomiting and can eliminate the poison. There was an army colonel who heard Lumpur mention this a number of times, and it stuck in his memory. One day he took a group of soldiers on patrol in the jungle, and one of them got bitten by a snake. The colonel remembered Lumpur's words. He asked for donations of excrement and urine. They were mixed together and forced down the man's throat. At that point, his jaw was already stuff, stiff. He went cold and started to vomit. He survived. That's the end of the readings. Andamayam damakata sadhikarangadam